we have a morphism from the fundamental group of the leaf with base point B to uh, a group of uh, defined, is it working? Is it defined locally in the neighborhood of, of B. In For instance, if we are working in the holomorphic category, then this is going to be homomorphisms. If we are working in other category, it's going to be something else. Uh, okay. be better. So we have a morphism from the fundamental group of the leaf to the group of diffeomorphisms defined uh, in T, but just in a neighborhood of P. And uh, if we are working, for instance, with holomorphic foliations, these are germs of B holomorphisms. If we are working in other categories, it's going to be something else. For instance, if there are C1 foliations, these are going to be diffeomorphisms of C1 class. Uh, the image is what we are going to call the allonomy group of the leaf. And uh, for instance, if the leaf is compact, this is going to be a finitely generated group of uh, local diffeomorphisms, right? And just uh, if someone doesn't know, this is essentially the analog of the Poincaré first return map. You can see, for instance, of course, we work in the holomorphic category, but it's more or less the same. It's the generalization of that. If you can see, for instance, a foliation uh, in the plane, in the real plane, such that has a circle as a leaf, then you can actually consider a submersion. This could be the fibers of the submersion, the, the red cars, and then uh, you're going to have the first return map by following the, the leaves of the one-dimensional foliation in the neighborhood of this car. Something very simple. In the case that we are considering all the, all the sets, all the analytic sets, uh, for instance, have uh, a positive uh, complex dimensions. So even if the dimension is one, from the real point of view are going to be surfaces and the transversals are going to be also surfaces, even in, in dimension one and co-dimension one. But the idea is essentially the same. We are, uh, uh, we are actually here, we would have uh, a path in, in the base, okay, in the, in the leaf, and we are lifting this path to the nearby leaves. That's, uh, it's, uh, it's that simple. Okay, uh, a theorem that I want to mention, uh, kind of very well-known theorem in that you can study in the curse uh, in, in foliations, is that if you have a compact lead of a C1 foliation that has finite allonomy group, then there exists a fundamental system of saturated neighborhoods of the leaf. Saturated means that uh, uh, the neighborhood is a union of leaves. And uh, all leaves in a neighborhood, of course, are compact. That's part of the theorem. So we are going to come back to this later in, in a situation in which we are not going to require so strong a condition, uh, being uh, that the allonomy group being finite. Let's let, let we are going to consider something a little bit weaker. And of course, in this situation, it is very easy to construct a first integral defined in a neighborhood of the leaf because you just have to build a function that is invariant by the action of the group. And since the group is finite, that's almost immediate. So no problem. So uh, what we are going to consider today is uh, holomorphic foliations of any dimension and any co-dimension, but uh, from the local viewpoint. And uh, the important part is, is the co-dimension, because we are going to work with the autonomy and what determines, uh, okay, in 
which group we are working is, is essentially the, what I mentioned. That's going to be a little bit clear later on. So we consider holomorphic foliations that can have singular points. As I said, this is because, for instance, if you consider a holomorphic foliation in CP2, uh, it always has singular points. It always has a, at least one singular point. So if you don't add this condition, for instance, if you consider just regular foliations, uh, there are none in CP2 regular holomorphic foliations, so we add this so that we obtain more examples. And uh, we say that it has closed leaves if uh, the closure, for instance, in the useful topology, is an analytic variety of dimension P. This is because, for instance, if you consider again of CP2, uh, it's, it's not just that all foliations have at least one singularity, but that there are no compact leaves. If you, you can have compact curves, that's possible, but those compact curves, those compact invariant curves, always have at least one singularity. So the leaf uh, that is contained in that compact curve is, in that compact invariant curve, is the curve minus a finite number of points. And so uh, uh, there are no compact leaves in CP2 for any foliation, but if you consider this extended definition, then yes, it's possible to find examples, of course, uh, for instance, examples that have a rational first integral in which there are uh, compact, uh, compact leaves after adding the singular points. Uh, an example is the radial foliation in C2 or CP2. Uh, sorry. Uh, we consider just or the foliation that has this first integral, sorry. And uh, you can take a look to this in, in C2. Uh, what happens is that uh, all the leaves intersect at the unique singular point of the foliation. This even happens if you take a look in CP2. The, the line at infinity uh, consists of regular points and all the lines, all these lines intersect uh, transversely the line at infinity. So. So we have here an example in which with the sorry. Could I ask, uh, the dimension of the closure of L is equal to the dimension of L, is that right? Yeah, is that right, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the same dimension, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, here we have that with this extended definition, all leaves are indeed closed but uh, because they are CP1. But if you look at the, at the leaf, you, you just have to remove the singular point and they are not compact, they are be holomorphic to C. So that's, that's the, simple, the simplest example, the foliation in CP2 with the fewer number of singularities. Because uh, the number can be calculated in terms of the degree and this is an example of foliation of degree zero. Is the essentially the unique example of foliation of degree zero after uh, conjugacy. So what we want to know is if uh, the exist the this property this is that all leaves are closed. Indeed, in, in the global setting, that could be all leaves are compact. But since we are going to work locally, we can write here closed if this actually implies a stability. What does it mean, a stability? Uh, what, uh, it's gonna be, by definition, that all holonomy groups of all leaves are finite groups. If uh, we have that, we say that the foliation is stable. Uh, in this sense, okay? It's not as stable by the formations of the foliation or whatever, it's just this, that the holonomy groups are finite. 
And with this uh, definition, the finiteness of holonomy groups of all leaves, uh, another real question is whether uh, we have first integrals, reasonable first integrals. Uh, and the answer is uh, no one know. Uh, the, the all leaves being closed does not imply stability, and we are going to see a very simple example. And uh, stability does not imply existence of nice first integrals, and we are going to see more or less uh, another example. So uh, how can we build an example? Uh, it's, it's very simple. You consider just the torus. Uh, you consider here the universal cover and uh, the torus as, uh, as the quotient of the universal cover by the group of deck transformations. And now you, build, you want to build with that <coughs> uh, a foliation that is going to be a suspension uh, by doing a quotient in C3, so it's going to be a foliation that it's going to be of dimension one and co-dimension two. Mm, okay, and uh, what we do is, uh, here we have this identification of C and C plus one, we consider this diffeomorphism. Uh, X and Y and C, all of them are complex variables. And the first uh, diffeomorphism that we consider to do the suspension is the one that sends x, y to x, x plus y. And the second one is the identity. That second one you we can forget. So since these maps over here uh, preserve the foliation uh, by these uh, horizontal lines, uh, this uh, provides a foliation in the quotient, but indeed a, a suspension. And uh, if we take a look to this uh, from a global point of view, of course, the, the leaves are not closed because uh, the orbits of this map uh, are not closed. This, this map in every line x equal constant is a translation. So uh, the orbits accumulate at infinity. So it's they're, they're not closed. But if you take a look to this mm, from a point uh, from a local point of view uh, as a foliation just defined in a neighborhood of the compact leaf okay then uh, the orbits are finite okay uh, because of course uh, for every fixed x we have translations and translations in a bounded domain have finite orbits okay so <coughs> and the issue is that even if uh, we study global problems. Uh, the holonomy group uh, actually only provides groups of germs, of diffeomorphisms. So <coughs> this is a, a real tricky problem in foliation theory in the holomorphic category to determine the groups of germs of biholomorphisms that can actually be uh, groups of holonomy of leaves of uh, foliations defined, for instance, to be two. This is mm, not known at all because the object that you get is local. Obviously, the fact that the foliation is global has to mean something for that group. So uh, that group should, uh, I don't know, satisfy some properties, but it's not known exactly what those are. That's an active field of research and a very, very difficult problem. So that's a reason to focus on the neighborhood of a leaf and even in, in, in situations in which the foliation can be defined globally in a compact, uh, complex analytic manifold. So, <coughs> okay, we have that uh, we, uh, uh, the, first, the first thing, uh, we don't have that the existence of closed leaves because obviously if uh, here it's the the orbits of a uh, translation are finite sets, and obviously, if uh, the intersection of a leaf with uh, a transverse uh, set, a transverse um, section, is finite, it's because uh, the leaf is closed. So this is an example of foliation of closed leaves. Okay, 
uh, but uh, with uh, uh, infinite holonomy group because this map over here has infinite order. For the second question, uh, whether stability implies the existence of first integrals, there is an example in foliation theory in, in the uh, for which is uh, the it's called the Suzuki's example. So you consider this foliation over here given by this uh, one form, and it has first integral. When I say here first integral is a nice first integral, for instance, a quotient of holomorphic functions. This is not it's not going to be considered a nice one because of uh, the need to consider here the exponential of, of this meromorphic function. But, but there is a first integral. Uh, if uh, the, the level sets of this function are the leaves of this foliation. And there is another, another one, which is uh, this one that has a first integral. And you can think, okay, wh what's the connection between these two? The connection is that these two uh, foliations are topologically conjugated. So the holonomy groups are the same. Um, obviously, in the second case, uh, the existence of the first integral implies that they are all finite. So in the first case, they are also finite. What's the picture of this? OK, let's go over here. You have a foliation, and you do a transformation that is called the blow up of the origin. You replace the origin with an exceptional divisor that represents the lines of approximation to the divisor. For instance, over here, if you blow up this point, you obtain a CP1 uh, that has one point for every of, uh, so that every of the lines through the origin intersects this CP1 in one point. So you separate the lines through the origin by doing a blow up. This is a technique that is used extensively to the singularize uh, analytic objects and even foliations because it increases the transversality of objects. You get from, from here from things that intersect, you get to things that don't intersect, from things that have certain order of tangency, you get to things that have uh, uh, and a smaller in the order of tangency. Okay, and the situation in this case is something like this. Uh, the CP1, I'm going to design like a circle, but it's a CP1. And uh, there is one leaf. Uh, in the second case, it could be I squared minus X cubed equals zero that is tangent to the exceptional divisor in one point, and the other leaves are like this. And so uh, what happens in this example is that uh, uh, locally here, every leaf intersects the exceptional divisor in two points. And this gives a local involution for a foliation that uh, uh, conforms to that picture. Both foliations actually are represented for that picture. What happens in this case, in the second one, is that the involution is global, and in the first one, is, uh, it's just defined locally. And uh, because of, uh, and, and now, the problem is that we're working in the holomorphic category, and essentially you cannot, um, the conjugacies that you can use are not many. Uh, they are going to be all Mibius transformations over the divisor, and so for that, for that reason, the fact that the involution in one case is global, and in the other, in one case, you, you can define always lo locally, but in one case, in the second one, it extends to an involution in the whole divisor, and the first one, it doesn't. And for that reason, uh, these two things are not analytically conjugated, but since the picture is that one, it's very easy to prove that they are topologically conjugated. Okay. So 
I, I wanted to, to give an introduction uh, to this. It's important to have, it, it's nice to have finite autonomy groups. It's, it's nice to, uh, to have uh, nice first integrals and even the, the finiteness of autonomy groups does not necessarily imply nice first integrals because of phenomenon like this. The, these leaps, the, the tangency of these leaps creates some kind of transcendent phenomenon. This, this example, as I said, is due to Suzuki. Are you sure? <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, but there is, uh, this, this example, I think, is, uh, comes after a very celebrated theory in foliation, in foliation theory in, in the field of holomorphic foliations, which is this one due to Mateja Musu from the 1980 which says that if you have a local holomorphic foliation in CN0, indeed you can consider here C2 because the proof is in C2 and then they generalize to any, to any dimension of the ambient space. If you consider a uh, foliation given locally with uh, leaves of codimension one, and you, uh, th what they want is a criterion, uh, Topological criterion to determine the existence of holomorphic a uh, holomorphic first integral. Okay, we are in codimension one, so we just need one function, a, uh, uh, a function defined in a neighborhood of the origin and such that its level sets are the leaves of the foliation. And so, um, uh, what? Uh, what uh, they require is that the leaves are, are close, okay? But obviously you have to avoid this situation because if you have a first integral that is holomorphic, the leaves that actually uh, have a closure that contain the origin are the ones that co are contained in the zero level if the function has zero value at the origin. And so there are finitely many of those leaves whose closure contains the origin. This example does not have a holomorphic first integral except obviously a constant map. So, uh, but obviously when we talk about holomorphic first integrals, we talk about things that are not non-constant. So we have to require that, that uh, besides having closed leaves, the leaves that contain the origin in its closure are finitely many. And in those conditions, the foliation has a holomorphic first integral. And uh, this is a very nice result because this is a topological criterion. I mean, the, if you have a topological conjugacy between two local holomorphic manifolds of codimension one, this property is topological and this one is also topological, so uh, under these conditions, having a holomorphic first integral is a topological property. Uh, okay. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about uh, the global case. Uh, if you consider a regular, regular here, we don't have singularities anymore, holomorphic foliation with closed leaves defined in a compact killer manifold then the foliation is uh, stable. This is a result by Edwards, Millet, and Sullivan from 77. And uh, it's a very, very nice result. Of course, uh, the degree of generality in which they work is actually much bigger than holomorphic foliations. But uh, this, this would be just a corollary of the result. In the case of holomorphic foliations, it is the simplest condition maybe that you can ask in order to use the theorem is that you're working in a killer manifold. And, uh, and okay, then the foliation is stable. It's not known uh, whether this condition here is necessary or not. I mean, what I mean is that there is no non-example of a uh, regular holomorphic foliation with closed leaves defined in a compact manifold that is non-stable. But uh, I don't know whether there is an example or not, it's, it's not known. 
And there is, uh, this essentially uses uh, topological techniques. Uh, uses a little bit of currents too, but it's, uh, it's to make the arguments more elegant, basically. And uh, it is of a fl topological flavor in part because it's not a paper about holomorphic foliations. But if you focus on holomorphic foliations and more, uh, and in particular in a projective manifold, you can use other techniques. For instance, you can use uh, uh, techniques of algebraic geometry. In particular, in this paper, it's used the Hilbert scheme of sub-manifolds of a projective manifold, a sub-varieties of a projective manifold. And so we have this beautiful theorem in which if we have a holomorphic foliation of dimension P that has closed leaves in the sense that uh, we explain, I mean, we admit singularities, and you suppose that the singular set of this uh, foliation is small, uh, is, is less than the dimension of the foliation, then the foliation is stable, and in this case, there is a very nice first integral. There is a rational first integral. Indeed, there is a rational map whose target is of dimension p. So essentially, the leaves are the level sets of a rational map. This is a, a very beautiful result, a very, very short paper. I think it's nine pages. Um, so, uh, we are going to to consider, uh, we are going to go back to the local setting. We are going to consider a compact leaf of a co-dimension Q holomorphic foliation. And what happens is that closed leaves in a neighborhood of the leaf uh, correspond to closed orbits for the holonomy group. But the issue is that it's very easy to see that closed orbits are are finite orbits and finite orbits are closed orbits. An orbit is closed if and only if it's finite. This is because orbits are, are self-similar, so the minute they are closed, either, either they're finite or uncountable. Uh, and of course, since the holonomy group is finitely generated, orbits are of the holonomy group are always countable. So close is equivalent in this setting to finite. Ah, okay. And so the holonomy group, uh, here we have, for instance, an example of a leaf that could be a torus. Here we have uh, a point in the leaf, a transverse section, T, and the holonomy group is, as I explained uh, a few minutes ago, a group of germs of B holomorphisms defined in a neighborhood of P in T. But obviously, we can identify T with C to the Q, where Q is the co-dimension, and P with zero. So we just have to work with groups of germs of P-holomorphism defined in a neighborhood of the origin. OK? Um, so we consider groups of germs of B-holomorphisms. Germs means that we allow ourselves to reduce the domain of definition of these groups. Because obviously we want this thing to be a group. So yeah, just in order to compose, we need to fix the origin. But uh, obviously we could have this problem in which the, the image of, uh, of one of the diffeomorphisms actually is bigger than the domain of definition of another. And so in order to avoid uh, this problem, we allow ourselves to reduce the domain of definition so that any two germs can be composed. So it's a trick to make this a group again. And so uh, we can consider the forward orbit of the point now we are in this setting, a uh, germ of B holomorphism defined in a neighborhood of the origin in CM. We consider the forward orbit, which is we iterate as much as we can, as long as we stay in the domain of definition. And yeah, uh, all the points that we obtain in that way are the points in the forward orbit. It's very simple. Uh, in the same way, we can define the backwards orbit, 
just by replacing the definition, the diffeomorphism by its inverse, and the total orbit is just going to be the union of those sets. And so we say that uh, local biholomorphism it has finite orbits if we have some neighborhood of the origin such that this orbit of every p is finite for any of them. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the translation that the, 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 the well, okay, the map that uh, I consider is a good example. So that uh, diffeomorphism over there obviously does not have uh, closed orbits when you consider it as a diffeomorphism in C2. But when you consider it as a diffeomorphism in a neighborhood of the origin and you restrict the orbits to a bounded neighborhood of the origin, it has finite orbits. So it could be one of the examples that we consider, right? Okay, uh, yeah, I already talked about this theorem, but uh, what I wanted to say is that one of the main ingredients in the proof of this result is that if you have a finitely generated subgroup of diffeomorphisms, uh, holomorphic diffeomorphisms in one variable, germs of holomorphic diffeomorphisms, that has finite orbits, then uh, of course uh, you have to m consider a definition for a group, but it's uh, the same one. As, uh, you, I think you can, uh, it's it's not difficult. I mean, I did for for a cyclic group, but it's it's simple also for any finitely generated group. So if you have a group with finite orbits, then necessarily it's a finite group. Okay, that's obviously not true in dimension two, in which the group generated by this guy is actually uh, has finite orbits, but it's obviously a non-finite group because this element over here has uh, infinite order. So as I said, uh, because of uh, the suspension has a holonomy group with finite orbits, it has closed leaves in the neighborhood of the zero section. And uh, here you can ask a few questions about uh, okay, uh, a few questions about what does it mean for a local biholomorphism to have finite orbits, because there are not many examples. Of course, you have all diffeomorphisms that are of finite order, but besides that, uh, you have that one. It's an example, but there are not many many examples. And uh, if you are in the linear case, if you have a linear map, then uh, you have finite orbits if and only if all the eigenvalues are roots of unity. So, okay, that's, that's an interesting uh, result that we are going to, uh, to remember. And uh, we would like to know whether to, to relate the property of finite orbits for one germ of biholomorphism to the properties of the linear part. I mean, it would be interesting to know if having finite orbits for phi implies having finite orbits for the linear part. And that would imply, of course, that all eigenvalues are roots of unity. Is that true? It's not true. What we know is that uh, if you have a local biholomorphism with finite orbits, then all eigenvalues of the linear part are actually uh, complex numbers of modulus one, they are in the circle, right? And the reason is that you have the stable manifold theorem. The minute there is an eigenvalue with uh, modulus different than one, for instance, smaller than one, there is gonna be a stable manifold, and in there the origin is an attractor, so all orbits in there, except of course the orbit of the origin, are infinite. Indeed, they are attracted by the origin. If you have an eigenvalue which is smaller than one, there is a stable manifold of positive dimension. If you have an eigenvalue of modulus greater than one, you have an unstable manifold, and you consider the inverse of phi. Okay, so all eigenvalues by the stable manifold theorem are actually in the circle. And here you have examples in which the eigenvalues are are, are even simpler than that because 
uh, here this is a unipotent map. So uh, all I, the, 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 there is just one eigenvalue which is equal to one. So yeah, is, is it possible to build examples in which, uh, in which the eigenvalues are not necessarily roots of unity? And of course, since there, there are not many examples and uh, it's complicated to work in this problem in the in discrete dynamics, you can consider, okay, let's make it a little bit simpler. We're going to work in continuous dynamics. So we're going to consider a local holomorphism with finite orbits, but we're going to embed it in a one parameter group. So that is the time T map of a holomorphic vector field with a singular point at the origin. And then uh, instead of working with phi, we can work with the vector field and okay, in this way we can ask what happens with the spectrum of the linear part of phi and the result is the same as we had for linear maps. The result is that all eigenvalues are roots of unity. So okay, the both in the linear setting and in let's say in the continuous uh, setting, uh, we have the same result, that, that all eigenvalues are roots of unity. And indeed, that was, by many people, something that was considered very likely. That, uh, that this, uh, I think that was a conjecture for, for quite a few people. Sorry, ah. okay, in the continuous case, if, uh, okay, another way of uh, explaining the result is that if you consider uh, an element a diffeomorphism embedded in a one parameter group, having finite orbits for the big holomorphism implies having finite orbits for its linear part. But uh, this is a PhD student of mine, Lucivanio Lisboa, and uh, in his thesis, uh, it was proved the, the next result. If we consider a Kramer number, you can find uh, a function of one complex variable, an analytic function defined in a neighborhood of the origin, such that the value at the origin is zero. We can even consider that it's a multiple of x squared, of x cubed, or whatever, and such that this map over here has finite orbits in C times U, where U is any bounded neighborhood of the origin. So what's a Kramer number is a complex number with modulus one, but that is not a root of unity, and such that it satisfies that the limit of these uh, end uh, roots of the modulus of lambda n minus one is equal to zero. It's more or less that it's very well approximated by, by roots of unity. If you have a root of unity, this is going to be zero infinitely many times, if you are very well approximated by rationals, th this uh, lim inf is going to be zero. It's it's not a generic condition in in even for for uh, complex numbers in the circle. So you have uh, a, which is since it's a complex function defined in a neighborhood of the origin, it has a Taylor power series expansion. And what happens is that when you consider the empt iterate of the map obtained like this, then uh, this part over here is very simple, lambda to the m times x. But this part over here, you can see that we have uh, these denominators that are very, very, very small under this condition, at least for infinitely many ends. And this is going to be the reason that is going to make the the orbits to be finite and I'm, I'm not going to explain more uh, but it's it's that but what we could prove actually is that uh, again in the thesis of uh, Lucy Banio is is that uh, if you have a local holomorphism with finite orbits then for some iterate the fixed point set of the iterate actually contains a car, has positive dimension. And here, this happens in this example. If you take a look to, to, to the diffeomorphism, it has two eigenvalues, the linear part. One of them is lambda, the other one is one. So not all of them are roots of unity. 
but you have a curve of fixed points because x equals zero is a curve of fixed points. And uh, okay, uh, and this result in particular. Okay, well, uh, before that, I, I I want to say something. Uh, I, s I wrote here there is a sort of Camacho Sat theorem for the finite orbits case. There is a theorem, a very uh, important theorem, again in the theory of holomorphic foliations in dimension two, which is that if you have a, a local foliation defined in a neighborhood of a point, then there is always an invariant analytic car going through that point. And uh, th that's what is called in general in the theory a separatrix. Because in the real case, it could separate things. But OK, uh, the, 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 the name is stuck even if in the complex case, it doesn't separate anything. The, the, complementary is, uh, the complement is connected. So uh, but uh, this existence of invariant curves, it's something that it happens in dimension two for vector fields, but it doesn't happen in a higher dimension. For instance, there is a result of Gomet Mon and Luengo, I don't remember now exactly the year, but it's uh, the 80s too, that says that uh, there exists a holomorphic vector field defined in a neighborhood of the origin in dimension three and with no invariant curves through the origin. So having an invariant curve uh, for a um, uh, vector field or a biholomorphism is something that is rare in a uh, higher dimension and higher means uh, greater or equal than three. But in the case of finite orbits, it's a property that uh, it's gonna be true in any dimension. We proved this result, I think, for n equal two, but uh, now we know how to generalize it for every dimension. And then, as a consequence, if you have a local biholomorphism with finite orbits, then at least one of the eigenvalues is a root of unity because you consider this set, you iterate, and uh, uh, any point in the tangent cone of this set is, is going to give a, an eigendirection uh, whose eigenvalue is equal one. So, uh, they are, so okay, we have uh, for the linear part, the one eigenvalue for an iterate, so we're gonna have a root of unity for the initial linear, linear part. So uh, this, this result in particular implies that we always have at least one eigenvalue that is root of unity, but not all of them, because we just saw an example, an example of finite orbits be holomorphism with one eigenvalue that is a root of unity and the other one that is not. Okay, so as I said, the spectrum contains a root of unity in every possible case, and there are examples in dimension n that have finite orbits and such that uh, there is exactly one root of unity eigenvalue. We saw an example for dimension two, but you can build an example for any dimension. It's uh, the same ideas. So uh, let's, uh, let's go back to, to the general to the problem that we wanted to 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 deal with, I mean, uh, this w uh, the, the what I talked about the linear part is to illustrate some of the difficulties that we have. Uh, we want to consider a regular foliation, uh, not with yeah with compact leads on a compact manifold that that. That's, for instance, the, the setting that you can find in the Edwards, Millet, and Sullivan paper. And in that case, they have the bad set, which is the set of leaves in which the volume function, you can define uh, a volume in every leaf, and the bad leaves are the ones in which the volume function is not locally bounded. Because if the volume function is locally bounded, the autonomy group is finite. So those bad leaves are the ones that support autonomy groups that are not finite. And in our case, uh, for a local biholomorphism, the equivalent concept could be more or less the set of periodic points. So the bad set are going to be the periodic points. So what can we do? Our goal here uh, now is uh, to, to essentially, uh, sorry, 
I want to give an idea of the proof of this result. I want to give an idea of why the finite orbits property implies that for some iterate, you have a non-trivial fixed point set, a positive dimension fixed point set. So um, I'm gonna talk about the steps of the proof, but uh, how much time do I have? No, no. Well, I'm going to, it's, it's gonna be fast, sorry. Uh, so there are some steps of the proof. We, we built a non-trivial continuum containing the origin. Then you can uh, write this continuum, uh, this invariant continuum as, uh, as a union essentially of analytic sets because, uh, uh, because of course uh, the points in the back set are periodic. So it's gonna be the union of the set of uh, points that are a fix for sun iterate for for any k and uh, what happens here is that there is a trick that says that if you have an irreducible component of some of these iterates the the map that sends every point to the spectrum of the linear part of this diffeomorphism at p p is a fixed point of phi phi to the power k is constant uh, and uh, uh Okay, the, the idea of the proof is considering this decomposition and considering what uh, I could call a chain of irreducible components that is just uh, some, uh, some, some components over here that intersect at least in a point. So, okay, uh, very, very, very simply. There is uh, one trick that uh, Unipotent diffeomorphisms, diffeomorphisms whose linear part has just one eigen value, which is equal one, are very special because uh, they have this property in which everything that is periodic and can be defined algebraically becomes invariant. This is more or less the equivalent result to saying that if you have a unipotent matrix, uh, the linear algebraic group generated by the matrix and one of its iterates is the same one. So everything that is periodic becomes invariant. And, uh, oop, and what we do is we have here a, a components of the bad set, irreducible components of the bad set. And the point is proving that in one of these chains, I mean, when we consider components that are intersecting in chain is simply just it, that every component intersects the nest. What we want to prove is that there are not chains with infinitely many components. So here we have that the points over here, for instance, have period K1, here K2, you consider this iterate, uh, the iterate of order K1 times K2, you obtain this map, so now these things over here are fixed points. And over here, since we have two curves uh, of fixed points for psi, the eigenvalue, the unique eigenvalue of the linear part is one. Now you use, it's written in the previous slide that the eigenvalue is gonna be constant over this component. It, this is a consequence of the stable manifold theorem. So here is also going to be one. And this is a curve of periodic points for, for the germ defined at this point. But then you use that the eigenvalue of the linear part is one and this trick that says unipotent B holomorphisms if they have something that is periodic, it's invariant. So all the points over here are fixed, and then doing the same, all the points over all the curves in the chain are fixed, and so they are all in the fixed point set of this guy, and so this is an analytic set that the number of irreducible components have to be finite. So what we do is uh, the chains are obviously disjoint and compact, they are compact by the previous result because they have many f uh, infinite, uh, finitely many reducible components. And uh, the bad set is a union of chains. And we use here a result that is also, that also appears in the Edward Millet Sullivan paper that says that if you have a continuum that is a countable union of pairwise disjoint compact sets, then uh, it's just one of them. So our bad set is our set of periodic points, any connected component of that set is going to be analytic because a chain is analytic. So we get uh, conne the connected components of the bad set are analytic and in that way, uh, that's the proof, uh, we get 
to prove these results. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, here, uh, what I explained to you is for a cyclic group, but you can generalize it for a finitely generated subgroup with finite orbits. You're always going to have a, a, a finite index normal subgroup such that the fixed point set is non-trivial, and in that way you have some sort of stability in intermediate dimension. If you have a co-dimension p regular holomorphic foliation defined in an neighborhood of a compact leaf, and it has closed leaves, you're going to have an analytic set of dimension greater than n minus p, so it's not restricted to the compact leaf, so that is invariant, contains L, and there exists a fundamental system of saturated neighborhoods consisting of compact leaves, and the holonomy groups restricted to that S are finite. How this is just uh, how you do that? Uh, how you go from the cyclic case to the general case in which the group is just finitely generated? There are a few tricks. One of them is that uh, you can suppose that it's virtually solvable. This is uh, something that in Lie group theory is called the Stassenhaus lemma. I'm not going to say anymore. But you're going to have if a group has finite orbits, it's not any group. And so it's virtually solvable, so you can suppose that essentially that is solvable. And then you do an induction in the derived let of length of the group. I mean, it's easy if it's a billion, because uh, the fixed point set of an element is preserved by others. And then you can move, uh, you can go from groups that are a billion to groups whose derived length is two, and then three, and so on. And this induction is not very difficult. So you can, the, the what I wanted to say is that the most difficult case is the cyclic case. So thank you very much. Do you have any quick questions for Javier? Okay, then. Thank you.